Hello, welcome to Midlife Chris, the podcast brought to you by BAMSouth.com. I'm your host, Jack Chris. Happy 2016. Happy New Year. We are very pleased to be joined by a good friend of mine and a noted libertarian scholar and thinker and advocate, Mr. Stefan Kinsella, who is at his home in Houston, Texas. Stefan has become uh, known for a lot of things in his career. Mainly, though, what we're going to talk about today briefly is his opposition to intellectual property and copyright. Now, Stefan is a patent attorney, and yet he is opposed to this concept and has gone so far in an article even that we publish in BenSouth.com is calling it one of the greatest evils facing uh, lovers of freedom and this country today. Stefan, welcome to the show. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to, to you, Jack. Listen, uh, we can get theoretical about this, and I know you have. And for people who are interested, we'll give them more resources later. But but let's start with the whole premise. Intellectual property, most people take that as, as a given, as, as part of property rights like owning a house or a car. If I produce something, if I create it, I own it. It's mine. And yet you say that this is incorrect. Moreover, it is, as you have said, evil. Can you give us in a nutshell why you're opposed to intellectual property and what is the inherent problem with the whole concept? Well, so let's take the two biggest forms of intellectual property, um, so-called intellectual property. Uh, I actually think it, it should not be called a property right because it, it is not really a natural property right. That's just the name that was given to this by defenders of these two basically state grants of monopoly privilege, patent and copyright. The reason I oppose them is that they both infringe human rights and property rights, and, and they are, they're, they're antithetical to freedom of speech and the free market and competition. A patent basically means that you, if you come up with an invention, you are protected from competition for about 17 years. Now, the free market, in my mind, is about competition. And if you come up with a product on the market and other people see that and it's popular and they want to emulate that to compete with you, there's, that is part of the free market process. There is there's no reason that you should have a 17-year uh, monopoly protection over a given idea. Uh, if it's if it if it should be seventeen, why not make it a thousand years or a million years? Why but, should it last forever if you really have a right to this idea that you came up with? But doesn't it keep people from stealing your idea or putting their name on something that you have written or created? Isn't that part of the the underlying premise behind it? No, th th that's just one of the smoke screens that's used by defenders of these systems. There's, there's a lot of companies that make lots of money off of the patent and the copyright system. The publishing industry and Hollywood make. Lots of money off of the monopoly position that copyright gives them in movies and books and music and software. And the patent system protects entrenched industries from competition. Like you have the smartphone players, Apple, Samsung, companies like that face much reduced competition because they each sit on war chests of thousands and tens of thousands of patents, which they can use to attack anyone who dares to compete with them. So a lot of small upstart companies cannot compete with these with these larger companies. So it basically result, results in oligopolies and cartels. Um, so the problem with the patent system is that it basically is protectionism, but, uh, and it and it retards innovation. It slows down innovation. If you are a company that's sitting on a bunch of patents and you have a monopoly position in a given industry, you have less incentive to innovate because you can just sit on your laurels for 17 years and collect monopoly profits but, from your from your products. But Stefan, you and I both know a lot of conservatives, a lot of free market advocates, objectivists, and even some libertarians who defend uh, the copyright system as part and parcel of a capitalist system. And, and it, the way you describe it, it's like a conspiracy, or it's like these uh, Hollywood conglomerates have gotten together and said, all right, we're going to push and, and promote copyright, and our law firms are, and keep competition yeah. away and stifle it. Well, it's not surprising that most uh, patent attorneys who, uh, who, whose bread and butter, you know, wh whose bread is buttered by the patent system are in favor of it, any more than it's surprising that public school teachers are in favor of government schools. Um, it's not surprising that in industries that are entrenched and uh, they profit off of this system by basically taking money from the consumer or by making them poor because there's less innovation and less competition. It's not surprising that they're in favor of it. It's not surprising that they have Congress in their pockets. But in a nutshell, what happened was historically patents arose as, uh, as pro pro 
protectionist monopoly grants of privilege by kings to cronies, and copyrights arose as a way of thought control and censorship when the printing press emerged. And these things morphed into the system that we have in the U.S. today and in the West today. Um, I think the, the, fam- the founders of the country put, put patent and copyright into the Constitution because they were confused and probably because a lot of them were the authors and inventors of the day. They, would, they were the type of class that would benefit from these types of privileges. Uh, but that doesn't mean they had a lot of empirical evidence or that it was justified. Uh, it's morphed into something truly horrible. It does stifle creativity. It threatens freedom on the Internet because you have uh, various treaties and laws uh, coming in the name of copyright protection that's, that are threatening freedom on the Internet. And the Internet is one of the most important tools that we human beings have as a, as a weapon to fight for liberty and to fight the tyranny of the state. We need to communicate with each other. We need to be able to have total freedom on the Internet. And anything that threatens that is very dangerous to human liberty, in my opinion. Well, no one argues that, but but I've heard the case made for copyright and patent from people who say, well, it protects my property, keeps other people from stealing my ideas. I mean, if I write a manuscript and I don't copyright it, Stephen Kinsella or Rob Dillard or anybody could pick it up and go publish it under their name, and I'm left holding the bag even though I created it. Well, so that... uh I wouldn't call copying some pattern of information stealing. It's just mean copying. So people call it stealing or theft uh, just as, a, as, a, uh, as an argumentative tactic. It's, it's when you copy something, you're not stealing it. If you put your name on someone else's manuscript, that is dishonest and that's lying, but we actually don't make lying illegal as a crime either in this country. Lying is not illegal, um, and if that was a real risk, why aren't people doing that right now with – the, the hundreds of thousands of public domain works that are not protected by copyright. So, for example, Jack, you could publish tomorrow. Um, you could take uh, – what's your favorite Aristotle book? The, uh, maybe the Nicomachean Ethics? Yeah. Okay, you could publish that tomorrow. You could call it uh, uh, Jack Chris's Ethics. You could just copy it and publish it. There's no law preventing that whatsoever. But why don't people do that? Because they would be looked at like laughingstocks. They would be frauds. But- so – Copyright is not about stopping fraud or not about stopping uh, consumer fraud. It's not about stopping plagiarism either. It's only about preventing copying. It's amazing to me, though, the way you describe it. And I, we published your articles, as I mentioned, on BAMSouth.com. You've been on the John Stossel Show on Fox Business. You've spoken all over the world. It sounds commonsensical to me, and yet every law firm in this country is is full of intellectual property uh, arms, and, and it's considered a such a big thing. The Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, is in favor of it. The Ayn Rand Institute, a, a free market think tank, is in favor of it. You're bucking the trend. I, I don't know if it's so apparent why it's so controversial. Um, well, for some reason, the sales job that was done by the entrenched industries that were in favor of these laws um, has worked. Them calling it intellectual property was a brilliant uh, tactical move, which they did in response to these uh, economists in the 1800s, the free market economists who were opposed uh, to, the, to, the, to the rise of copyright and patent systems. They saw them as a monopoly grants by the state, which were con- uh, contrary to the free market. And in response to this growing criticism of these laws, the, the industries that were relying upon copyright and patents, like the uh, uh, certain, certain, uh, certain entrenched um, uh, innovative industries and the publishing industries uh, lobbied by calling it intellectual property. So they wanted to make everyone think it's just a part of a proprietarian system, part of the capitalist Western system. Um, after all, you can buy and sell and trade these rights, and people make money off of it. The thing is, Jack, <laughs> we have to realize – we have to have a, a shift in our thinking. We have to realize that copying – it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So instead of calling it stealing, we need to call it what it is. It's copying. And another word for that is called learning. And another word for that is <laughs> called competition. We all are in favor of the free market and competition, but when you compete, what do you do? You emulate what other people are doing that's successful, and you start doing what they're doing to get some of their customers. You could say – I could say you stole my customer, but that, that word steal is not actually legitimate there. You didn't steal a customer because you don't own your customers. People have the right to do what they want. Competition is fine. Copying someone's works 
look, if you don't want your work to be copied, don't make it public. That's, that's the basic answer. If you put something out on the market, you have to face the fact that you might have competition and people might actually learn from you and emulate what you're doing. But I can't, I can't make a profit off of my creation if I don't put it out there. Well, we have copying right now. It's called piracy. So piracy is widespread. Uh, and yet the Star Wars movie, which had a $200 million budget, is already at $1.5 billion yeah. in gross revenues. Uh, even in the face of po- piracy and copying. So apparently it is possible to make a profit. Uh, Tylenol sells for twice the price of the generic acetaminophen on the shelf of the drugstore, and yet some people buy Tylenol still. Uh, there are ways yeah. to make profits. And anyway, the point of the, of the law and the, the role of the government is not to make sure you can make a profit doing what you want to do. It's your job to figure out how to make a profit given an institutional framework that respects property rights but doesn't give you protection over your information that's in your head. If you don't want information to become public, don't reveal it to anyone else. Our guest is Stephen Kinsella on the Midlife Chris Show. I'm Jack Chris, and I know you're about to appear on the Tom Woods podcast, one of our favorites, so we're not going to keep you much longer. But how much does intellectual property laws hurt us, Stephen, every year in this country? And how tangibly does copyright hurt us without us even knowing it? Copyright's harder to estimate the dollar amount of harm that it does. I think copyright is more of a threat to freedom, basically. Uh, it's, it's like estimating the cost of censorship. I don't know what the, the financial cost of censorship is. I do believe copyright law heavily distorts culture. It changes things from the way they would be. For example, the reason we have so many sequels in, in Hollywood is because of the way copyright works. They're protected. No one can make a knockoff of a movie or a sequel without permission – of the original, and so the, 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 the established players just do sequels. So, for, so it's distorted culture, um, and it also threatens Internet freedom. So I would say copyright is the, huge, the biggest harm existentially to us as a species because it threatens human liberty. Patents, I think, basically retard innovation and cost us hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, every year. I've tried to do estimates. My, my rough guess is that the, the patent system probably costs maybe a trillion dollars a year to the world in net loss That's because of lost innovation and all the costs we have to pay for patent attorneys and for higher product prices and for reduced competition. So the, the cost of the patent system is immense and huge. It slows down innovation, and it costs us lots of welfare and resources and money every year. The copyright system reduces our liberty substantially. Unbelievable. Stefan, now you have got speeches, articles, books all over the Internet, and uh, it's not copyrighted, I suppose. What is your email address or what is your website? How can people read and learn more about uh, your opposition to intellectual property? All my material is on stefankinsella.com, and I have a CC0 license on there, which means I have no copyright claim on anything. Anyone is free to take it. You can even put your name on it if you want. I don't I, care. I may do that. Now, look, before we let you go, you, you call yourself an anarcho-capitalist. Briefly, what is that? What does that mean? And I take it you don't vote. I don't, I don't vote. I don't think politics is a legitimate uh, – I don't think it's an effective way of making change um, because the worst rise to the top and all the politicians are uh, – the good poli- – the ones that are they're, – they're, <laughs> that are good at it, like Bill Clinton, you know, they're, they're basically are going to be sellouts and, and, and socialists from one strike or the other. Anarcho-capitalism just means an, a consistent libertarian, someone who believes in strong individual rights, a free market, property rights, and as opposed to all forms of aggression or crime. Um, we use that word because capitalist was used by Ayn Rand as a synonym for libertarian, and we say anarcho to emphasize that we also are opposed to the state as the biggest institutionalized form of aggression or crime um, in human life. All fascinating. We're going to have you on again. Before we let you go, though, Stephen Kinsella, here on the Midlife Chris, we're going to put you in the hot seat and ask you some questions so people can find out more about who the real Stephen Kinsella is. First of all, Stephen, what's the best cigar out there in the market? I don't know the best. I don't know if there is a best, but uh, you can't go wrong with like a good Romeo and Juliet from Cuba. All right. What's the best wine out there? Oh, well, there's a good, um, I told you earlier, there's a good Gergich Hills uh, 
uh, uh, Chardonnay, which is really nice. But if you, you really for the best one, it's got to be a red, probably a Zinfandel or, or, or Burgundy. Um, and those are, it's hard to pick. There's so many good ones. Okay, the best song ever written. Wish You Were Here, Pink Floyd. <laughs> the worst song <laughs> ever written. <laughs> um, Uncle Albert by the Beatles. <laughs> That's Paul McCartney and Wings. Damn it, get okay. it right if you're going you're to criticize right. the song. Okay, finally, the right. most, excluding your lovely wife, Cindy, the most beautiful woman in the world is? Okay, I was going to say Halle Berry. She's a contender. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, the, what's the, the the Italian actress from The Matrix? Uh, um, uh, you know what I mean, Monica Bellucci. Ah, okay. Well, there we go. Gotcha so, on that one. Yeah. See now, now we know more about Stephen Kinsella than probably we care to know. Our guest, Mr. Stephen Kinsella, from Houston, Texas. I'm Jack Chris. This is the Midlife Chris Show. Stephen, Happy New Year, man, and I hope 2016 is good to you. Happy New Year to you, man. All right, take care. I'm Jack Chris. Stay with us. We're going to be back with more Midlife Chris. After just a brief break. This is the Midlife Chris podcast on BAMSouth.com. I'm your host, Jack Chris. Happy New Year. We are very pleased to be joined via telephone, Professor Eric Thomas Weber, who is uh, a, actually a, a very well-known author. He is a professor at uh, Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, Associate Professor of Public Policy Leadership. He is the author of Rawls, Dewey, and Constructivism, rather, and Morality, Leadership, and Public Policy, as well as his two most recent books, Democracy and Leadership on Pragmatism and Virtue, and the recent Uniting Mississippi, which I believe, Eric, uh, the latter two were both published by University Press of Mississippi. Is that correct? Well, the, the last one was. The, the prior one, Democracy and Leadership, came out with the Lexington books. I see. Well, listen, welcome to Midlife Chris, and Happy New Year. Thank you very much, and same to you. Eric, what brought you to Ole Miss, first of all? I mean, you teach uh, philosophy, and uh, you, you've made a name for yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. And uh, secondly, well, I, I do teach philosophy as a subject matter, but I do so in a program called Public Policy Leadership, and that's what brought me to the University of Mississippi. My background is in philosophy, as you said, but I'm most interested in the practical applications of philosophy, and there are many of those, though lots of people aren't very much aware of them. Uh, and so when I saw an opportunity to be the practical philosopher in a program called Public Policy Leadership, where I'll be able to focus on ethics and, and public policy as well as the philosophy of leadership, it sounded just like what I was looking for, and so that's what brought me to Oxford. You know, I know a little philosophy, and that makes me a dangerous person, but shouldn't all philosophy be practical? I mean, do you have to teach your students that this is not some ivory tower subject? This is something that actually affects our every decision, and uh, it especially uh, affects our public policy, which I know is kind of your specialty. How do you get that across to your students? Well, first of all, the answer is absolutely. Uh, of course, there's an issue of perceptions that people have. I mean, when you think about something as fundamental and, and lived as an experience as issues in medical ethics, when you've got difficulties about deciding what to do about mom when she's gotten old and, and you don't have clear instructions about what to do in this instance, deciding about those matters when there isn't clear law about such things, for instance, or clear guidelines, you've got to think together about what's best. And these are moral questions. These are things very much that happen in life. And yes, philosophy is central for, for everyday life, let alone public policy, because it's about the love of wisdom. And, and it's a study of how we can make sense of wisdom and the good life. And so to me, it's deeply practical. And yet, of course, some uh, questions and ideas can sound very abstract. But of course, that's, that's what thinking does. Is it, it abstracts from, from some particular and tries to think of principles and tries to make sense of the world, you know. But yeah. uh, of course, the reason for that is practical and application. Eric, before, so, we, before we get into the specifics of your books, especially your more recent book, uh, Uniting Mississippi, I have to ask, we hear so often that students today just aren't quite as sharp as they used to be. And I guess we hear that from older people. And we read about the protests or the, the safe rooms and, you know, that we've got a, a lot of uh, 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 crybaby types on our campuses today. What is your experience with the student body at Ole Miss? Are they, are they sharp kids? Are they, uh, they well-grounded? Tell me about your, uh, your students. 
Sure, sure. So my, the first thing to say, though, is that is that you know every generation that said all oh, these kids today, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> there's something about our our present kids that's a, that's the problem. They've lost you know a sense of value. Every generation has said that sort of thing. <laughs> but but uh, what I, what I can say for, to you though is that you know I'm I'm somewhat spoiled because the program in public policy leadership is a is a selective one. It's a very strong, high performing set of students, and so half of them are in the honors college, some somewhere around half. And and so I see some of the strongest, most engaged students in my program. Uh, I think that overall, however, though the the, the students are. Uh, strong students at the university, and in my program, there are truly excellent students, actually, that I'd put up against some of the best students at any number of schools. Um, but uh, this notion of safe words and, st and stuff or, or being careful about offending people, I think that's just sort of a continuation of uh, the, the, the sensitivity and the sort of lawsuits, kind of the, the culture uh, where, where, you know, if you upset people, there's, there's a big noise. But but at the same time, um, you know, I, I think that that hasn't changed so much. People used to get offended by so much less in past generations. Just think about the fact that at a certain point in time, it was unacceptable to air Elvis Presley below the waist yeah. when he was performing, yeah. right? And so, and so now compare that with today, where we're talking about seeing the, the N-word, for instance, in a text. You know, the, there's, there's differences of degree, and people were outraged about seeing Elvis's hips, you know? And so if you, if you I think, take things into comparison with the past, uh, we're, we're not so different. In fact, we're, we're more, I think, tolerant than we used to be. Eric, you know, democracy comes up a lot in your articles. I know you write for the Clarion Ledger and other publications and in your books. Um, there are among uh, uh, those who listen and probably read BAMSouth.com and, and, and other publications, uh, the notion that this country, this state, we should not properly be a democracy. We're a republic, and democracy is just another name for majority rule. How would you answer that? Uh, well, so uh, a, a republic is a, it's sort of a form of government. Uh, and uh, literally what the word means, if you boil it down, comes from res publica. It's the public thing. And, and, of course, the most influential source on that subject was Plato, who wrote the book The Republic. Yeah. And, yeah, we have some great you know, history in the Roman Republic and then elsewhere and then forward. Uh, but but, but I, when I think about forms of government, I don't necessarily think this is, uh, exactly of a democratic process of voting, of having everyone vote on every decision. That would be cumbersome and... and uh, you know, that wouldn't make sense. People need to specialize in various ways, and so instead we vote on representatives. And so when, when we're talking about Mississippi and we're talking about democracy, what are we talking about? We're really talking, it seems to me, about culture and about what that republic is supposed to be doing. Uh, is it supposed to be only representing the few, such as in an oligarchy, uh, or, or should it be representing everybody? Should everybody's interests matter? And so it isn't that everybody needs to be coming out to vote about every decision. That's not what real democracy makes. That's not democracy that makes sense anyway. But it's about caring about the power of the people and all people uh, having some some kind of degree of equality. That not that we are the same, but we should be treated the same about many things basically. And so um, we shouldn't have, for instance, hierarchies of citizenship where these people are a certain kind of citizen that matter, and let's say those citizens aren't, and they don't get to vote, for instance. I mean, you know, we do that with young people, but all young people, not, not just some groups, young people, right? You know, so, so uh, th there's a kind of equality that's crucial for democracy, even if we have to have people specialized and, say, running for office and representing us. Uh, and, and so democracy is a set of values, and, it's a, and frankly, it's a way of life. Is there an ideal, so the, ideal democracy in your mind, or, or one that you envision, or one that we can aspire to? Sure, absolutely. So democracy is very much an ideal, and 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 actually, one of the great democratic thinkers, John Dewey, called it a radical ideal. It, you know, to really be democratic would be quite different from how we live right now. Uh, but at the same time, we can be more or less democratic, and uh, the less we are, in, in a lot of instances, it causes serious problems, right? We don't look out for the interests of certain people, and we trample on their rights and so forth, and that's, that's what we find problematic. So rule of the majority is 
is an element of of uh, democracy, but it's not just any which decision gets decided that way because there's got to be rules of the game. And so you've got, for instance, to protect minority rights. Otherwise, you're not treating everyone equ equally. You can't just have some people have free speech. You need everybody to be able to have free speech, right? And, and so we need rights which limit what the majority can do. So the majority can't just decide that some people don't get to speak. Right. And, and, and because we have to have those rules, those rules protect everyone's liberty uh, and, and thereby, unfortunately, for, for the majority, that limits what the majority can decide. And so um, democracy is a good bit is more is more complicated than just having sort of what's most popular, you know, decided and, and picked for everybody. This is the Midlife Chris podcast on BAMSouth.com. I'm your host, Jack Chris, and we're joined by Mr. Eric Thomas Weber, who's the associate professor of public policy leadership at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. Now, Eric, the new book is Uniting Mississippi. It's a provocative title. I haven't had a chance to read your book, I'm sorry to say, but just based on the title, what do we need to unite? Aren't we already together? What, what's the problem here? What's, what's, what, how do we bring Mississippi together, and why do we need to bring it together? Okay. Good, good questions, <laughs> and, and thanks for asking. So um, there are some things about which Mississippi is united. When, when now, today, when, when uh, there are elections, anyone can come out to vote, and those people who, who feel uh, strongly and want to speak up do so, for instance. And those are some ways in which uh, we, we all get to participate. We all get mail delivered to our houses and so forth. But, but then there are some important ways in which what I was saying about hierarchies of citizenship uh, remain in, in the state of Mississippi. And so we are divided in some crucial ways. In 2007, for instance, I just have certain numbers that stand out because they were so striking. Mm -hmm. In 2007, there was a Johns Hopkins uh, report put out by the Associate, uh, Associated Press that found that Canton County uh, School District in Mississippi was graduating th less than 32 percent of its uh, of the people who entered as freshmen so it had a retention rate from freshman to senior year of of uh, less than the, about 30 31 percent uh, and so that means nearly 70 percent of their students who entered as freshmen were not graduating from high school and when you look at what the prospects are and the opportunities are for people who don't have a high school degree they're dismal. They're troubling, right? You know, you, you, there's m many jobs you can't get. Your likely earnings are very low. And if you look at the number of people uh, who are incarcerated who don't have a high school diploma, it's 80%. So, so we are channeling people into poverty and then to, uh, you know, uh, educational failure into incarceration eventually for many uh, and, and that's happening in a patterned way uh, among poor persons who are especially african-american in these in historically black districts they're getting uh, a significantly inferior education and once they're incarcerated of course they can't vote anymore and so they're disenfranchised in that way and so the cycle continues we have high teen pregnancy and these things are consolidated these are, are things which affect a certain group of people, not just everyone. If it, if it were just that sort of everyone had a certain process, that'd be one thing, but we do have you know, patterns, and it isn't only having a pattern that matters, but the history of this. But then how, a reason do, for these things. how does unity come into it then? I mean, and based unity on this... Unity is crucial, because if we, don't, if we don't care about people who aren't my kid, then these patterns persist. And so it's crucial that we care about each other's children, and that we do everything we can to make sure that all Mississippians have a chance to succeed, a real chance to succeed. Let me, let me ask yes, you... Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, so it's just, it, you know, if, if there are uh, these kinds of strong patterns, and there are, there, are, there were, I think, 44 school districts that were failing or at risk of failing at the time of that study that I was talking about, and things have gotten a little bit better, uh, but, but it, it's really striking how... Uh, you know, delineated these the, the the differences are when you're talking about who has real opportunities at, at life and who doesn't. For instance, the likelihood of doing decently well and succeeding in college when you have an ACT score of 2021 20, or or 22 is, is at a certain rate and isn't too bad. But then if you're below that, it's not so good. And and the average ACT score for white students in Mississippi is about a 21, and for African American students is a 16. 
right? And and so uh, even when we do have students graduate from these poorer districts, let's say like Canton, that 30% that does graduate and maybe takes the ACT, well, a significant number of those people are graduating and taking getting ACT scores lower than than 16. You know, and their likelihood, even if they do get into college, is is low of succeeding unless they unless they have a high GPA, which which can which can change some things. But the point is yeah. that we have a we have a difference between you know the life opportunities, a significant difference in life opportunities for people who are white and who are black and who are poor and who are wealthy in this state. And what changes that is having people care okay, and Aaron, really try. But let me, let, me, let me stop you and ask you this. Where There's got to be a fine line, or where do you differentiate or draw the distinction between caring and legislation? Well, the f- first thing is you, you've got to care before you're going to have any legislation. Okay, so that's, yeah. that, that's why I start there with this notion of unity, right? For, for Plato in, in the great city, you know, he thought that uh, you know, he, it was so important for people to feel united for otherwise, when invaders come attack, you won't defend your neighbor, and that person will perish, and as a city, you'll be weaker. Well, the analogy today is the same. If you have companies who come here and they want to build a business and they see that the workforce isn't trained, they're not going to stay. And so we lose out in some other way today. Whereas if we had a good uh, education and strong support such that everyone really had a chance everywhere, we'd have a higher educated workforce. We'd have more companies coming here to invest and build businesses, and we'd all, we'd all do better as a result. And so, we, it's, so caring is a first step, and then the next step, okay, now that we do care, here's what it'll take to make certain kinds of differences. Well, you know, I think one thing also that, that libertarians and, and more progressive liberals can agree on also is decriminalization, for example, of drug laws. Uh, Absolutely. You mentioned the high incarceration, uh, incarceration rate, and that is certainly a fact. Uh, that's one thing we could agree on. So, there, you know, I, yep. I see, I see some, some patterns here. Uh, let me, in, in the time remaining, Eric, on, here on Midlife, Chris, let me ask you about the, the primary message that you want readers to take away from uniting Mississippi and, and what do you see as our biggest problem? I mean, you touched on some things, but is it the flag? Is it, is it the fact that 42 was defeated? Uh, uh, answer those two questions for me, if you will. I, I probably sure. believe they're related. So. Right. In, 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 uh, when you look at all the challenges and problems we face as a state, there's a lot of particulars, whether it's teen pregnancy, hyper-incarceration, problems in terms of succeeding in, in, ter- in education for everybody. All of those are, are, are particular issues that are deeply important. At bottom, however, they all are rooted in a culture in which certain people, you know, are, are advantaged and have the life that they want, and so they're not concerned about the system otherwise. And other people really struggle. They don't feel that they can be heard. They, they don't feel unified altogether, and therefore you don't. Uh, they don't get the same kind of chance. They don't get the same kinds of schools, and, and therefore it seems to me you've got to work on the culture uh, in order to get people to sort of see that we're all in the same boat. And once you have everybody in the same boat, you will do certain things. Different differently as far as sex education, as far as education funding, as far as the flag is a symbol. And, and I think uh, any individual realizes that uh, changing the flag hasn't just changed everybody's life, but it's a symbol of something, which is the underlying culture. And it is fundamentally a symbol of division, whatever else you think of it. It is undoubtedly a symbol of division. And so it seems to me clear that what Mississippi needs is a more united culture such that we will then be ready to attack all the particular particular issues that I've just been talking about, about sex education, about, about hyper-incarceration, about needing education funding, and so forth. When, when, when we feel that it's important, when we all realize how important it is to unite as a state, as a group of people who will do better together, that's when I think any of these particular, and I deal in the book with many of the particulars, yeah. um, all of these different particulars can be looked at and, and addressed, and, and we can say, oh, okay, here's a better way to do this, so that yeah. not just these kids do well, but everybody. Can. Eric, you sound just like a damn bleeding heart liberal. 
Okay. How's that? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Listen, that's see, interesting because in, no. <laughs> in general, liberalism is thought to be an isolationist, atomistic kind of point of view, where I'm just thinking about the individual making an agreement with another individual so that we don't trample on each other's rights, and, and that's the, the sort of social contract liberalism there you go. Uh, that's focused on the individual. But what I'm talking about is the culture, I which understand. is much more communitarian in that sense. So, so um, and I'm so being... I care... I care about liberty, but, uh, so, and, and in that sense, I'm, I'm a big, big picture liberal, I suppose. But, yeah. but everybody cares about liberty, um, and I, what I'm seeing is how important the culture is for us to care about each other. So I, I that could be cons- perfectly consistent with a kind of conservatism. It, it isn't necessarily liberal in that sense. No, I agree. Um, I agree. And I was being a little bit facetious. Yeah. I look. I, I, the, I, I realize <laughs> the, the thing about midlife, Chris, is this is not the Bill O'Reilly show. Okay, we want to hear your <laughs> views. I don't think people want to hear mine right now. But look, Eric, I know you're touring behind the book, Uniting Mississippi. Tell us where people can get a copy, where can they see you, meet you, and talk to you about this very uh, fascinating and interesting thesis. Well, excellent. Uh, uh, thanks. So the, the book is available at local bookstores around Mississippi. It's online. You can get it from local bookstores if you want to shop local at places like, you know, Square Books website or the various uh, uh, small bookstores websites. It's also at the enormous websites uh, for books that I won't mention by name. Uh, you know, you can, you can get it online. You can get it at local bookstores around Mississippi and, and in surrounding states. But um, I'll also be giving a number of talks, one on the 29th of this month in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, and then I'm giving a brown bag talk at the university here in Oxford. So you drink, uh, you, brown bag, you drink when you, when you give the lecture? <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to ask you what's in your brown bag, but I'll probably just have a sandwich. <laughs> See, Eric, now, now you sound like a damn capitalist promoting your book. That's a good thing. But, but when are you going to be doing the, the luncheon at Ole Miss? Oh, that one's going to be on February 3rd. Perfect. Yeah, I believe it's a Wednesday. All right, well, look, tell us... Uh, we got to ask this very important question. Were you at the Sugar Bowl? I was not at the Sugar Bowl, except in spirit, watching it on my couch. And okay. it was amazing. <laughs> okay, and, and finally, Eric Thomas. Oh, oh and, and one, one last thing yeah. about football. If, you, if your quarterback doesn't feel united with the receiver, you're not going to make a pass. Unity matters, man, and we can do this. <laughs> and, and I think we have lots of well, cultural resources to draw on to show how we agree and where we agree and why we think to, that, that you know, we should feel united together. Eric Thomas Weber has been our guest on the Midlife Chris podcast. All right, Eric, i got to hit you with a few questions so people can really learn the real Eric Thomas Weber. So first of all, if you could live anywhere on earth, where would you live? Oh, goodness, that's a great question. I tell you, I absolutely love southern France. It's so beautiful, and I have some family from there, and it's gorgeous. (laughs) All right, what is the worst pop song ever recorded? Oh, goodness. Uh, probably one from Millie Vanilli, though. I can't remember the name. <laughs> well, there goes your uh, Christmas gift for next year. Uh, <laughs> what, what does Eric Thomas Weber read in his spare time? And, and something that would surprise people. We know you read Aristotle and Plato, but, but what, what do you read that might surprise people? Um, well, recently, Ken Follett. I was really blown away by Pillars of the Earth. A lot of people already knew that, but I hadn't read it yet, and it was amazing. And since you made the football connection with Unity, and i, I got to tell you, that was pretty good, tying it in with your book, who's, <laughs> who's going to win the Super Bowl this year? I have absolutely no idea. No, you got to give an answer, <laughs> Eric. Those are the rules. Oh, goodness. Well, if I, if I knew anything, I would tell you something intelligent. Uh, I've, I've long, I used to be a fan of the New York Giants, and so in my ignorance, that's what I'm going to say, but I have no idea. Well, they're out of the playoffs, so you missed that. But look, exactly. Uh, we will be, we'll be talking to you again soon, I'm sure. It's Eric Thomas Weber. He's a professor at Ole Miss. His latest book is called Uniting Mississippi, and it's a fascinating read. And I don't care if you're a conservative libertarian. You need to read what other people think. And I do, and I enjoy Eric's uh, books. And Eric, uh, we've enjoyed you being on the Midlife Chris podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, Eric Thomas Weber, again, our guest. I'm Jack Chris. You've been listening to the Midlife Chris podcast only on BAMSouth.com. Thank you so much for your support. This is the Midlife Chris podcast brought to you by BAMSouth.com. I'm your host, Jack Chris. Happy 2016. Happy New Year. I want to tell you about one of our underwriters and sponsors here at the Midlife Chris Show. It's Deerfield Golf Club in Canton. Look, Deerfield Golf Club is a wonderful, wonderful place to play. Write the number down, 601-856-6900.
66. We're talking about one of only seven golf courses designed by Byron Nelson, who's, uh, of course, a World Golf Hall of Famer, and it was once ranked as high as number two in the state of Mississippi, the Deerfield Golf Club. Deerfield is an unbelievable course with plush fairways and fast greens, sure to test even the best of players. And let me tell you about a deal right now. If you're listening to the Midlife Chris Show, you can join Deerfield, pay your first month's dues with no joining fee and no further dues until March of this year. If you're under 35, one ninety nine a month membership. And if you're over 35, only $250 a month. Folks, you can't beat that. Because at other courses, you're going to pay, uh, you know, for your golf carts. You're going to pay for food and beverage minimums. At many of the country clubs around town, you can spend upwards of $300 a month easy. Don't hassle with all that at Deerfield Golf Club. Write the number down, 601-856-6966. Tell the folks at Deerfield Golf Club, Lee and everyone, that you heard about it on the Midlife Chris podcast and get your discount. It's Deerfield, truly the best golf course for the money in central Mississippi in the entire state. In fact, if you come out as a guest, play around for $20. If you don't like it, we'll give you your $20 back. John Rings, you can't beat that, can you? That's that's a great deal, Jack. Obviously, from being around the golf industry my entire life, uh, that's a great deal. People are wondering who I'm talking to. We've got John Rings in the studio. Now, folks who uh, keep up with BAMSouth.com know that John Rings has a weekly segment called Ringspiration. And, and that segment is for our listeners, viewers, and readers to get a bit of your inspiration, John, because you've become known as someone in the central Mississippi area who uh, promotes good things, positive things. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. John, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I know some people probably see Ring Inspiration and say, well, who is this guy? Is he a motivational speaker? Is he a lecturer? Does he does he own, uh, uh, you know, several businesses around town? Who is John Rings? What do you do? Jack, I am just a common man like you and I. <laughs> um, you know, I've got a wife and two kids. and Got a mortgage and all that. You know, I've got a house and cars and all that. I mean, I got to pay for them. Um, you know, one thing that I was thinking about over this past week, uh, going into the new year, which I use to refresh and review and think about, uh, goals for the upcoming year was getting more into public speaking, uh, sharing more of my views on what I feel, uh, needs to be heard and said in our community. What does need to be heard and said in our community, first of all, and then let me ask you, what qualifies you, John? I mean, you know, they're, they're motivational speakers. They're Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins and people like that. But, but some people might be skeptical and say, well, who's this guy? He's just an average Joe. Why should I listen to him? Well, Jack, I've been around for a while. I've, I've been in the banking industry for many years and have uh, been involved in different businesses. And I feel like that I've basically uh, developed a following uh, through Facebook, through LinkedIn, people that really listen and care to what I say. They, they value and trust the information that I provide. So social media? Yes. Now, do you come up with original content or do you share content that you find? And, and if so, where do you find these inspirational messages and how do you decide what to put out there and what, what to discard? Jack, what I really try to do is share positive information. Uh, Zig Ziglar, uh, Billy Cox are two of my favorite inspirational uh, leaders uh, that have uh, shared their information on Facebook. I try to look for information that will help uh, a man or woman uh, with their day. They uh, may be having a bad day. They may be looking for some kind of hope in that day. And I just try to share good information that's factual, that can maybe put a smile on somebody's face, and really just try to share not anything political or anything that's negative, but try to share more inspirational, uplifting type, you know, material. Yeah, but John, uh, do you think that's not being Pollyanna-ish? Do you think that's not being a little bit too pie in the sky? I mean, uh, should you temper it with a little negative news every now and then? 
Well, you know, and I'm I, playing devil's advocate here. Okay? I think I think you do need to mix it up some, and uh, some of my posts are, you know, the factual, realistic uh, viewpoint of what's going on in our society. Um, I do try to be uh, real as it pertains to that. There are some posts that may not be as positive as others, and but there, it's all good information that will inform people of what's going on in our society today. Well, let's back up, John. What made you, I mean, you said you've got a following, and you do. I mean, I, I keep up with you on Facebook, a little bit less on LinkedIn, but you do. You're known for putting out positive messages. When did you first start doing this? Was it something in your personal life? Did you decide, well, I'm going to, you know, this spoke to me. Maybe I'm going to share it, and it'll speak to other people. Tell us about the beginnings of this. Sure. Uh, Jack, about two or three years ago, uh, I was out running one day, which is one of my big hobbies. Oh, yeah. And I just started brainstorming and thinking, okay, what can I do uh, to basically get the word out or basically use the talents and skills that I that I possess to, to, to help other people? And I was not really big into social media up until about three years ago and really got into it and said, wow. You know, I started seeing the difference that it was making. People were starting to respond, starting to comment, and people were starting to share the things that I was sharing. And, you know, they always say uh, attitudes are contagious. A positive attitude is very contagious. And that's what, that's what I've tried to do. Do you think that, can you have too much of a good thing, though? I mean, can you, and I say this because I know some people who, I keep up with them on Facebook, too. It seems like they, they almost are trying to convince themselves that things are going to be better. And you know as well as I do, words are one thing, but you got to put the words into action. Right. All right? you you got to do that. And I know you understand that, mm-hmm. but have you ever heard from people, or, or do you sometimes feel like, well, maybe this is just too much, uh, too much verbiage and not enough nitty-gritty? Well, a lot of times I, I believe that, you know, you can have so much information but you know you you got to have action to a plan in order for a plan to become real and to be put into motion you've got to have an action and one of my resolutions this year is to act on uh some of my you know inspirations that i've I've felt for a few years do you do it for yourself primarily jack you know unselfishly you know Public speaking is something that I've really had a passion for for many years. I've just never acted on it. Um, education, of course, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I really want to continue this year going into schools and sharing information with kids on financial literacy, money management, things that will help them in their future. I think there's a big need for that. Um, I just, this is going to be the, be the year of action. John Rings is our guest here on the Midlife Chris Show. Of course, you can see John every week on the Ringspiration uh, uh, video cast that we put on BAMSouth.com. And we wanted to talk to him today to kind of go a little bit more in depth and find out more about him uh, and, and what makes him so positive. Now, is it all a state of mind, John? I mean, is, is it a matter of if you wake up and you're in a bad mood, the day's going to turn out bad. And conversely, if you wake up and you say, all right, there are going to be challenges, but if I've got the right attitude, I can get through them. Is it that psychologically easy? Hey, look, man, a lot of people are spending tons of money on therapists, on tranquilizers. A lot of people are drinking. A lot of people even use running as an escape means. You know that. Absolutely. It's healthy to run. It's what I've done it for for years. But, I mean, some people carry it to an extreme, man. I mean, you know, and you can do anything to an extreme. But is is it all, does it boil down to attitude? Jack, I really think it boils down to your values in life. I, I believe, you know, I was blessed to have two parents that instilled good values and good skills in, in myself uh, that built me up when I was growing up that to this day are a major uh, rock to my uh, well-being. Yeah. Uh, I talk to them a lot during the week. And I feel like that they helped mold me in a way that when I go out or I wake up every day, every day is not going to be a perfect or the best day of my life but I try to find things that I can take away to be positive, to look at it and say, you know what, 
Everyone has problems and issues in their life that they're having to deal with. That's life. We have to deal with it. But if we rely on the important things in our life, you know, obviously having God and family and friends and health. Health is a yep. big health is a big thing that a lot of people don't think about that's very important. So without health, you can't do a lot of things. But I, I get up and I'm very thankful to be able to do what I do every day, and that's to go out and share good news and reach out to those that, that need it. Let's talk about that, John, because you have, and you and I have covered this in Ringspiration in the past, you are speaking to uh, schools, to young people. Uh, I got I to gotta wonder what kind of audience, what kind of reception you get. Do they look at you and say, oh, this old guy, you know, hey. I, I, when I was young, I thought I was going to live forever, okay? The future was mine. Right. I didn't care. I didn't want to hear all this, you know, flowery stuff. I didn't want to hear about money or this and that. I, you know, the world was going to be mine. Wish I'd listened to it now at 50. But what kind of reception are you getting from these young people? And how did you start speaking to these schools? Tell us about that. Well, Jack, to be honest, uh, when my son started seventh grade this past year, I talked to uh, Ms. McCarter, his ICT2 teacher, and asked if I could come out and speak to her class or some of the classes about their money management financial literacy segment. And I, I was kind of, to be honest, didn't really know how that was going to go over. I mean, I seventh, bet. Yeah. you know, seventh grade is entering into the teenage years to where, you know, you really don't know how much they're going to listen to or if they're going to listen to you at all. At all, yeah. But what I found to help uh, bridge the gap was getting down to their level, giving them real life, real life examples of things that had actually happened, getting them involved, making it more of an interactive type discussion to where they felt like they were participating, not me just up there preaching and you know lecturing to them. Uh, I made it to where I asked a lot of good questions, and they in turn asked me a lot of good questions. I had to really <laughs> dig deep in my responses. I almost felt like I needed an attorney or an accountant <laughs> there with me. We've got some here, by the way, in the building here at Gil Ladner and Priest. Well, do you, uh, so you came away having learned something from them too. I, you know, Jack, I really felt like it instilled, you know, you know, God's timing is always perfect. And I felt like that I was there and I really felt like I was able to really dig in and the connection just, I mean, it just, it, it went a lot better than I ever anticipated. And are you going to start uh, uh, doing this more often on a regular basis, speaking to school groups and, and yes. other groups as well? Yes. I feel like through my experience and lessons that I've learned, through my successes, through my failures, that you know I have enough information and insight to provide these kids that they need. Uh, we all need information. You know, a lot of people you know, for what it's worth, don't know all the inner workings of banking. I feel like I learn something new every day, but, yeah. you know, something as simple as writing a check or balancing a check ledger or knowing how to keep up with how much money you have, how to, how to, how to balance all of that. They need to learn it. And you're going to teach them. You know, I enjoy it. John Rings here. He is the uh, the man behind Ringspiration on BAMSouth.com. He's our guest on this segment of the Midlife Chris podcast. I'm Jack Chris. You know, John, when I want to get inspired, I turn to If by Rudyard Kipling, one of my favorite poems. Mm -hmm. The song My Way by Frank Sinatra. Right. Just One Victory, Todd Rundgren. Others. Is there a favorite quote or poem or song that when you hear... Every time you hear it, you get picked up. You get inspired. John Rings gets inspired. Jack, I don't know if there's one particular song or saying. Uh, I like to read a lot. I, I, I do uh, you know, like to read a lot of inspirational uh, material. Zig Ziglar uh, has yeah. put out some. Uh, John Maxwell has put out some good leadership and uh, teamwork uh, books through the years. I don't know if there's one particular quote or song that really, you know, gets me going. You know, I guess I just try to mix it up and, and, and use, a com use a variety or combination of different 
you know, quotes and sayings that, that I that I've picked up through the years. What we're going to do, John, see, we're going to set you up to go on a speaking circuit and write some books. I want to be your manager, and I want to make a fortune off of you. I left him speechless, Rob. That's a, that's a, that sounds like a great <laughs> idea. That's the whole point. See, we're going to put you on the road, man, get you on, on all the TV talk shows and everything, and, and you're going to become the new motivational speaker from Jackson, Mississippi. How about that? Hey, that sounds like a great <laughs> idea. You, you said something to me before we went on the air, and this will be a nice way to close out the segment. What's the story about the guy giving out the, the pizza to the homeless person? I think you posted it on Facebook. G- give, me the, give me the story. And, and is this something... Uh, John Rings might do. Well, Jack, it's real simple. The, the, the post started out, the guy went by and asked a gentleman if he, if he could have a piece of pizza. And he went by the particular gentleman three different times, and the, and the guy refused to give him pizza. He, in turn, went and bought a pizza and gave the entire pizza to a homeless man. And he came back, and he sat down with the homeless man, and he said, Look, I'm, I'm really hungry. Do you, can I have a piece of that pizza? And the homeless man said, absolutely. He, in turn, sat there and shared with with the other gentleman. And the gentleman that bought the pizza, in turn, gave the homeless man Mm -hmm. some money. And, you know, regardless of what we're going through every day, you know, we've got to have a caring and a giving heart. I think it's very imperative that, that we have a giving heart, you know, I try to give every day and share where I can to those that need it. And it just it reiterates a valuable lesson that we all need to know and is that, you know, we've all got to be considerate, compassionate, sympathetic to all of our, our, our fellow man or woman. And, you know, it's called pay it forward, but, but I can speak from personal experience. You do. You call people. You call me. You check on me. You know, I've had some... Uh, issues with my mother and her illness lately. You've checked on me. Uh, Rob over here has checked on me. It's good to have friends like that. It's good, John. That's a positive message. Right. And, and goodness knows we need it now. Right. There's so much negativity in the world. And, right. and as you said, so many of us are going through troubles. We're masking it, whatever reason or however uh, we do so. And yet you are spreading those positive messages through Ringspiration, and we appreciate it, brother. All right, before I let you go, a couple of things. First of all, are you doing the Blues Marathon? I don't know if it's gonna the show's gonna come on after the marathon, but are you running it? I'm signed up for the quarter uh, this year. Not I've done the marathon, half marathon several times. I've done the relay. I'm gonna do the quarter this year. Well, man, that's a cakewalk for a guy like you. That's that's nothing. All right, but, now here here are the tough questions we ask every guest. We, we're gonna hit you with some questions to find out more about our guest. We want to know more about the real John Rings. What is your favorite? food in the world john wow well i would have to say food that i eat a lot probably chicken fried Uh, or baked probably fried and the guy runs eats fried chicken unbelievable you know and the the reason being i've I've got a little girl who loves chick-fil-a and we eat there several times a week and it just has become one of my favorite Things that I like to eat. I'm, I'm in Chick-fil-A Madison uh, this weekend with my daughter. And a guy looks at me. I guess he was the manager. He says, hey, Jack, how you doing? Good to see you. I, I don't know who it was. Anyway, it I made me feel kind of popular. All right, your first car, John. First car. Uh, my parents bought me a Buick Century. There you go. Not a bad car. What model it, was, it was it? It was, it was a very, very good car. What model? I'm not, I'm not sure what the, what the model was. But but at the time, uh, I, I just know I was very blessed <laughs> to have a car. What's the best movie ever made? Best movie ever made. Uh, my favorite movie. Uh, my favorite movie is Caddyshack. That, that's my that's my favorite. <laughs> movie. But but I would say how about a fresco? Uh, the probably the inspirational movie that I learned the most from probably Shawshank Redemption. That's a great film. Uh, there are there are a lot of lines, a lot of a lot of information that, that that teaches a valuable lesson. And if John Rings could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Wow, anywhere in the world. Uh, honestly, I love the city of Madison. I love I love where I live right now. But if if I had to pick yeah. a destination, uh, I'd probably want to go out go off to some deserted island out out in the Caribbean. Uh, Sounds good, John. 
John, I'd, I'd probably take you with me, Jack. I'd nah. probably take Rod too. I, I'd, I'd probably take both of y'all. We could just hey. go off and and just live happily ever after. Man, I'm a city boy. I mean, to me, camping out is having room service. I I, I can't. I wouldn't make it long. I wouldn't survive. John Rings has been our guest. It's Ringspiration. You'll be back next week with a new Ringspiration. Absolutely. On BAMSouth.com. Happy New Year, man. Happy New Year to you. Good to have you on the Midlife Chris podcast. I'm Jack Chris. Folks, stay with us. We'll be back. Hey, Jack Chris here, Midlife Chris. I want to take a few minutes to tell you about one of our sponsors and underwriters here at the Midlife Chris Show, and that's the law firm of Gill, Ladner, and Priest in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Write this number down, 601-352-5700. Gill, Ladner, and Priest truly cares about helping people, and I know all these gentlemen. I can tell you that's, the, that's true. It's a fact. That's why Gill, Ladner, and Priest provides free initial consultation on any legal matter. If Gil Ladner and Priest is not the right fit for your legal matter, they will do all they can to help you find the right attorney, and there's no commitment or further obligation required. Gil Ladner and Priest has had the privilege to help individuals from children to senior citizens, churches, small business owners, and larger businesses as well. Whatever your legal circumstance, Gil Ladner and Priest will listen to you, and they'll do all they can to help you, because they believe every client deserves to be treated the way you'd want to be treated. That's why Gil Ladner and Priest believes in doing the right thing and securing justice in each matter that is fair and reasonable. Because, you know, the U.S. justice system is the great equalizer when it's working correctly. The power of the legal system should be attainable by everyone, regardless of your status. And that's why Gil Ladner and Priest works primarily on a contingency fee basis. That means if you don't have the resources to pay for an attorney, you too can get their legal power. By working on this contingency fee basis, Gil Ladner and Priest only collects a fee if you have a successful recovery. In order to know if each client is receiving justice and the resolution is fair and reasonable, an attorney needs to know that client. At Gil Ladner and Priest, they get to know each client on a personal level so that every resolution is fair and reasonable under the circumstances. It's Bobby Gill, Kirk Ladner, and Jamie Priest, 601-352-5700. If you need to get legal power for yourself, your business, or loved one, go to www.getlegalpower.com or again, call 601-352-5700 for your free initial consultation with Gil, Ladner, and Priest attorneys in Ridgeland. Again, that's Gil, Ladner, and Priest, 601-352-5700. Sponsors of the Midlife Chris Show. The Midlife Chris Show is produced by Rainmaker Business Services and President Robert C. Dillard. For more information, that's www.rainmakerit.com or email rainmakerit at gmail.com. Again, Midlife Chris, sponsored and produced by Rainmaker Business Services and Rob Dillard.